Um, so back in February, basically, I wrote a decompiler because everybody was talking about Ethereum. Uh, I wish I'd bought uh, coins instead. I would have made more money out of it. So just to give you a quick introduction, um, if you don't follow me already on Twitter, so this is my handle. I'm also the organizer of a conference in Dubai. I didn't come to Vegas since 2011. I took a Vegas break. No, it's okay. I'm fine coming back again. Um, and my new claim to fame is to uh, have been called uh, a fun guy by the uh, shadow brokers. So, <laughs> so just so you know, uh, I won't be talking about like what blockchain is, Merkle trees, and uh, all those things. And uh, so we're gonna focus on smart contracts, uh, how to decompile them as uh, Windows reverse engineering. I thought it was interesting to analyze like the uh, VM itself. And uh, I'm also releasing a tool which is gonna be open source, so I'm gonna give the link at the end. And uh, yeah, and of course, like the tool is not perfect, so you're more than welcome to uh, contribute and uh, to give like a per request. Uh, just like a short overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the EVM, uh, its memory management, uh, or we can do like type discovery, uh, which is important, uh, especially with uh, many like static analysis, but also if you are building a, a decompiler, obviously, or it can be used for like static and dynamic analysis. Um, and uh, the non type of uh, class of bugs that we know so far. And what to expect in the future. So, how many of you are familiar with uh, Solidity? Uh, please raise your hand. So, basically, like Solidity is uh, the compiler for uh, Ethereum. So, the way Ethereum works is like to execute the smart contracts, it's basically like a software layer on top of the blockchain. So they use a compiler called Solidity, which is translating uh, code, which is uh, written in a JavaScript-like format into bytecode. Um, and Porosity is the tool I'm going to be describing today and releasing. Um, so if you're familiar with like chemistry and physics, it's the exact opposite of Solidity, uh, hence uh, the name. So. So far, like there is uh, a lot of accounts on uh, Ethereum. So there's like millions of them, and if you look at the actual number of uh, contract accounts, uh, it's almost one million. Probably it's one million by now. But the actual number of verified contract is very small, and the definition of uh, what's a verified uh, contract is very obscure. Um, but basically, it comes down to if the source code is provided. Um, so when it comes down to reverse engineering, like usually don't care if you have the source or not, but it's interesting that since this software layer had been introduced with Ethereum, uh, we see like a need for reverse engineering. Um, and especially since Ethereum introduced that concept of ICO to leverage uh, use cases for smart contracts, uh, we have heard a lot of stories since the beginning of the month. Uh, I think here I'm mentioning like Two, but I think like three different stories happened this month, uh, including uh, one with uh, Coin Dash, uh, which is like the the first one. Someone changed like the address uh, where to receive the funds, and most recently uh, Parity, which is a project um, started by uh, uh, one of the uh, key developer of Ethereum, uh, had the vulnerability in one of their uh, smart contract, and 30 million got lost and few days back something uh, happened with another ICO and 10 millions vanished. Um, so the, that's basically what happened when you're like writing software to store money but don't have proper like security checks. Um, it's more damaging than a blue screen of death. It's like a wallet of death. But uh, so the uh, EVM, so the Ethereum virtual machine, um, so for like each, uh, like you have like three concepts, like account, uh, contract, and blockchain are pretty much like interchangeable. Um, even like personally to me, like the, the difference is like quite obscure, but I mainly like focus on the actual bytecode which is stored on the actual blockchain. 
So a smart contract is basically a synonym, you know, a more fancy word for bytecode, and it's stored inside the blockchain. Um, it uses 160 bits addresses, and addresses correspond to an account. And one of the specificity also of the uh, Ethereum virtual machine is that it uses like 256 bits registers. Um, but they don't really have like registers like you would know in traditional uh, infrastructures like with x86 for instance. So they have like this concept of virtual stack. Um, the more you look at it the more you see like it was kind of like they're trying out different things. It's still like the outcome is still pretty good but if you're gonna build like, build, like a virtual uh, machine you know a lot of the uh, things are a bit uh, a bit shaky. Um, so for those who are not familiar with Solidity, that's basically what it looks like. Uh, so on the left, that's a simple like uh, coin contract. So it's very simple. Usually you have like few routines, you have like some storage memory, um, and even like the instructions themselves are like uh, quite straightforward. You do like many like uh, you store like uh, an integer. You do subtraction, uh, subtraction, addition, and so that's pretty much it. So, uh, like the level of complexity of a contract is uh, very far away from the complexity of a kernel driver per se. Um, then you compile it using Solidity, and then you get like all that bytecode, which is gonna end up on the actual uh, blockchain. And at the same time you compile, it also saves uh, the um, interface which is going to be used for like uh, other like uh, smart contracts to call that specific contract. So regarding the uh, memory management so you would have like three different type of memory uh, that are like significant. So the first one is the stack that I was mentioning before. Um, like under traditional architecture, you would use like the uh, stack to uh, push arguments. At least with x86, not with 64-bit uh, architectures, you would use like the stack to push arguments to a function. So here, you push arguments to opcodes, and then there is like a limited size to the actual uh, uh, stack, which is uh, 1,024 elements. And then you would have like two type of storage, so a persistent one, uh, which is designed, uh, as its name says, like to retain data, and another one, uh, which is like more volatile, that you can identify uh, easily from the instructions. So um, the volatile one is interesting because that's basically what will be used to like store strings. Um, but even if you look at it, the way it's done is still a, a bit dirty, but it does the job. Like I was saying, like smart contracts are like very uh, uh, simple, uh, a very simple pair design. So, if you do like static or dynamic analysis, uh, control flow graph, and especially if you write a decompiler, one of the most important things to understand is uh, the actual like control flow of your program. Uh, so the first thing we need to know is basically how to identify basic blocks. Um, so at least in that case with smart contract is so much easier than a traditional architecture. Um, because there's not all those concept of like code obfuscation and everything don't really exist uh, yet uh, with smart contracts. Uh, for sure we'd like expect them in the future. But it, it's not like uh, present yet. So in most of cases, they have like this instruction called jump test, which is uh, indicating like the beginning of a new block. Um, in most of cases, I would say like 85% of them, uh, you would have this instruction at the beginning of each block, and then you have a bunch of different instructions uh, for like conditional jumps or re traditional jumps. Um, the difference with traditional uh, architecture is like on x86, for instance. Uh, you would have your opcode and then the destination, right? In the same, um, in the uh, same opcode. Um, whereas, like here, they first push it on the stack and then execute the opcode uh, for that. Um, but the main difference is sometimes they're just going to push it at the beginning of the function, do a bunch of instructions, so you would totally like forget which uh, was like the destination address. So that's why you would need like to write a, a pseudo. Uh, debugger that you would have to emulate most of the instruction to keep track of all the uh, destinations. 
And uh, it's basically like one of the main limitation of static analysis with smart contracts. Otherwise, like most of it could be like done uh, statically, but because of like those like weird scenarios where like the uh, destination is stored uh, before and uh, you would have to like emulate like certain basic blocks in order to like keep uh, the uh, destination of uh, the basic block. Um, for like stack manipulations, there is basically like a uh, few instructions. So you have like a duplicate, swap, and a pop and push. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, when it comes to the actual opcodes of the uh, EVM, you can have like different. Uh, Categories. So obviously, like the main one is for like arithmetic functions. Um, it's mainly designed to like deal with money, to store, to create like wallets for transactions, which makes sense, right? And then you have like the uh, block environment and the environmental uh, informations, where you would have information about the sender, the person receiving it, and then you have all the memory uh, related operation plus some logging uh, operations to keep track of certain events. So, like I was saying before, the uh, main thing here, uh, so that's an example, where basically like opcodes are more like functions because you need to push the arguments on the virtual stack. Uh, so here, uh, for an addition, you would push like uh, the two variables that you want to add, and then you would retrieve the argument, uh, not in a register, but in the first item of the actual stack. Um, so that would come like that if you would write it in a EVM pseudocode. Um, then you have like uh, EVM calls. So those ones are like pretty interesting. They allow you to um, call like a different contract. Um, so you have multiple type of calls. So you have like the regular call, but also like delegate call, which is what had been uh, abused like recently in the uh, parity um, contract. Um, which is also interesting from the perspective that basically you call like third party libraries that you don't necessarily own. Uh, so that's also an interesting context. Uh, so it leaves a lot of um, opportunities for like undefined behavior. And when it comes down to like uh, static analysis, dynamic analysis, or even like trying to define your scope, uh, well, that creates a lot of issues. Um, there are like four exceptions for like outcoded contracts, so including for uh, SHA2 identity function and uh, for key recovery functions. So like the uh, contract addresses are like one, two, three, and four. So whenever you look at the actual bytecode, you would uh, notice like those static addresses. Um, so when it comes down to user defined functions that are exportable by default by each uh, smart contract, you would easily recognize how many parameters they have based on the uh, call data load instruction, which is basically reading the uh, uh, environment uh, information block, which is basically um, like a buffer that contains all the input uh, parameter, including the uh, hash of the function we want to execute. Um, so the structure of that uh, uh, block is pretty straightforward. Like the first four bytes would be the hash method of uh, the actual uh, function, uh, which we're gonna describe later. And then it would be followed by the actual arguments. So if you look at the actual like uh, pseudocode here so basically like a and b are being uh, recovered and the first parameter is like the actual offset inside that block um, and then for the addition um, that's what you would get so that function is like very simple uh, so it's an addition right um, but that's basically what it would look like in a pseudo uh, EVM uh, code so when it comes down to type discovery, um, the main type you would see and the main type you want to recognize uh, are addresses. So if this is like the address of the uh, sender, the destination of the wallet or of another contract, um, so it will be like encoded on 160 bits, right? And most of the time, every time you need to, uh, something which is not on 256 bits, right, you would see a hand operation. So in most of cases, you would see like, in some cases, you're gonna see it like outcoded, but in most of cases, you're gonna see like some uh, EVM assembly like 
uh, optimization, like uh, the following one where it's using like, um, uh, it's computing like the mask dynamically. Um, so there is like a few of them that we can uh, recognize like very easily. And again, like, uh, if we do like type discovery while emulating the code, we would actually, uh, we would even be actually uh, able to just like check the mask uh, associated to the instruction. Um, so now uh, that we have seen how like the actual EVM is kind of working, uh, let's talk about the bytecode now. So you're gonna have like two different categories. So you're gonna have like the preloader code and which is gonna be in charge of copying the actual smart contract where like all the interesting stuff is uh, inside the executable memory. And then which is uh, basically like the runtime code of the contract. And then uh, so the runtime code which is basically what we want to analyze contains all the information that we want to uh, spend the time on. So it would contain uh, the whole class, the whole contract, so each function. And which is basically like the, uh, what had been like produced by the uh, Solidity uh, compiler. Um, so this is what the actual like preloader looks like. So there is an in instruction called code copy which is basically in charge of like taking the actual bytecode of the contracts that we need to put it inside the executable memory so we can uh, execute it after at the offset uh, zero. And once we enter inside the actual uh, smart contract, there is like a dispatcher which is in charge of uh, splitting uh, all the different functions. So the way it works is basically like a giant uh, switch instruction. So it would first like recover the uh, hash method from the uh, call data load instruction and from that uh, so here you can see even like the uh, code optimization where basically it's just first reading like a 256 bit uh, register and then from that it would like uh, apply a mask to only extract like the uh, first four bytes. So that's basically like the hash method. And then you enter in a switch uh, statement which uh, on each switch statement is uh, corresponding to an actual function. and in some cases you're gonna also have a, a fallback function so for each uh, so if there is an unknown method which is not recognized by the smart contract it will just execute a method uh, by default and in some cases um, like the, in the case of the parity contract which is, which is what we're gonna see after also um, it redirects like a call blindly to another contract. Um, well, that's not the kind of things you would see like your kernel doing, you know? People would start to freak out to be honest. But that's something that seems normal for people writing smart contract. Um, some of those things to be honest are still ob obscure. Like uh, I don't really understand why you would have a fallback function. So I mean I understand why they did it because they have like this uh, thing where they want contracts to be like backward compatible and forward compatible. But the source of so much problem, like by uh, design, if you think of security, does not make much sense to be honest. Um, so function hashes, uh, the way they are like computed, basically they just take like the function name and the parameter of uh, each argument, and they just like stick them together and compute like the uh, shape free um, of that uh, input. And the result of the first four bytes would basically be uh, the hash method. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, so if you have like the uh, ABI, so the actual interface of the contract, uh, you can easily like recompute it. Uh, but if you don't, from the actual like switch function, you can just like extract the actual like hash method um, from the uh, runtime code, and you can create like. Um, um, like a name on the fly, like you would do, like uh, with IDA, where you just give like uh, a sub function with the actual offset of the function when you don't have symbols. So, like the ABI uh, JSON file is like the equivalent of symbols for smart contracts. Um, so, here is like the uh, instruction I was mentioning where they basically extract the uh, four bytes. Um, and then uh, that's like the uh, pseudocode for it. So, here is like a comparison. 
if you purely do like static control flow uh, like reconstruction or if you try to emulate so as you can see in some cases uh, you really need to emulate the code to keep track of all the uh, actual like destination um, and pointers. Um, so that would be like a simple contract where you would have like two functions uh, which is here. So once you can like uh, start to analyze the actual like runtime code from that uh, like I was saying it's basically like a giant switch but we know that each uh, case of the switch is basically uh, a function for it. Um, and then once we uh, decompile it we would get something closer to what's on the on the right of the screen. Um, to go a bit more into the detail of the uh, runtime code so here for instance like the uh, double function so in yellow we have the actual hash of that function then it's going to jump to the offset like 24. Uh, which is marked with the jump dest uh, instruction. And then it's pushing uh, the uh, argument to. Then we're having a new block. So here, in that case, uh, there is like a jump dest, but it's not uh, a new basic block, but it's used by another function. It's a shared basic block. And then you're just going to do like the multiplication. And same thing with the uh, triple. We're going to see it's going to read. Um, same thing again like the uh, input parameter, push like a free and then execute like the uh, multiple instruction. So and if we go back to the initial like source code of it, um, that's basically what it was doing. Um, it was pretty straightforward. So obviously these are like smart contracts that are way, uh, well I wouldn't say like way more complex than that but were like more complex than this. But that's basically to illustrate uh, how easy you can decompile the actual code. Um, if we look at the uh, bug I was mentioning before, so this is uh, the parity bug that happened like a week ago. Um, remember when I was uh, talking like uh, before, there is like different type of call. You have like a call, a delegate call. Uh, they allow you to call like a third-party contract, um, and then in some cases you have like um, a fallback function that allows you to uh, execute a contract. Uh, to execute like code if like a method is uh, unknown. So uh, here like the address uh, in the constructor like the address was outcoded and um, then you know it's in green it's computing the actual hash method like dynamically and delegate code is going to execute that, that specific function and then for some random reason you add uh, like a fallback function uh, that was basically like allowing you to call like any function inside the wallet library and to pass any function or parameter you want. So that's why I was saying like some of concepts are like really obscure. That was basically like the uh, actual uh, uh, reason for the vulnerability. So obviously, like now looking at it, it's obvious, but that's a new type of bug that have been uh, uh, discovered by the attacker. That's a pretty uh, good find. But now, like once you know that type of bug, it's pretty uh, it's pretty obvious. Um, so like those fallback functions. So if you have like a switch with uh, executing code with no, uh, no actual like hash, so that's what your fallback function would be. Uh, so I mean it's, then it's like a design uh, issue, right? So the main reason for that is, well keep in mind so it's adding like a software layer to uh, the blockchain, right? Uh, but also means that if there is like a security bug in it, well you cannot patch the blockchain, right? That's the main thing about it. It's like retaining data and moving it around. Uh, so the main reason because uh, uh, from reading about it, it's for like backward and forward compatibility because of this lack of capability to apply patches. Um, to be honest, still does not make sense. I think it's stupid, but uh, whatever. Uh, that's not how you can design a language which is verifiable because you have like too many unknowns. If you start calling like third party libraries, you don't even know what's going to be called. You have to predict uh, all contracts and all uh, future contracts. I mean, like, imagine if your kernel would be doing the actual same thing, you know, like uh, that would be nuts. You would start to see people rioting in the streets, you know. Well, I hope so. Um, so the actual way that bug was fixed is basically like uh, some of the function were designed to be private function and so when it was able to uh, call the uh, library again directly any function the actual constructor uh, 
or they could even like recall the actual constructor because it would not even check if it was initialized or not. So those are like the type of bugs you would see like with smart contracts. It's very far away from like the classical bugs you would see with like buffer overflow and everything. Um, here is another example of like uh, vulnerable contracts so that's similar to what the AO uh, was using. Uh, so here like the vulnerability was basically here. Uh, it's similar to a rest condition so basically same thing uh, it comes down to like a fallback function uh, being reused so that would create a rest condition where like the balance would not be initialized on time. Um, so for that type of vulnerability the good thing is because there is not many instructions you can like tag each basic block to see what they are doing and every time there is a call with an external contract uh, you will track it uh, either as a warning or as an error. So in that case uh, we could see that the uh, SS store instruction was being used after so it would be like easy to analyze. Um, I can show you a quick demo. Uh, that's uh, the actual like uh, uh, smart contract itself. Uh, so, no for that. so to call the tool, basically you can just like provide the. Uh, you only pro need to provide like the actual like bytecode. Uh, if you have like the symbols so or the ABI uh, JSON file, you can just pass it, and uh, then you just like run the tool to see. And uh, and once you like give it as an input to the tool, you can easily reconstruct something uh, very close to uh, the actual uh, source code. So, and uh, if you had like some features, because to build like a decompiler, uh, you basically build everything you need for like dynamic analysis and also static analysis. So you can easily easily. Um oh, I didn't see the subtitles over there. That's cool. Um, yeah, you can easily like uh, use it to track potential vulnerabilities, just like you would have with uh, most of compilers now. When you have like prefast or prefix with Visual Studio, uh, you have a lot of like static analysis tools that can be used um, whenever you are writing code, right? So now, like if you look at the actual like smart contract uh, community, uh, they're still like building all those tools. It's something very new. So a lot of the tools that we would find like uh, pretty obvious with GCC or Visual Studio Compiler are not present for uh, that those type of software. So, uh, so because like the whole concept was like to introduce a software layer to it but it comes without a lot of testing tool uh, which would be required for enterprise softwares. Um, so so far there are like a uh, few, few uh, class of bugs that have been detected. So the first one was like the rest condition used for like DO, uh, then called stack vulnerability. Um, there's some good papers about it where like I was saying before like the virtual stack itself is limited and once you use all of it um, well it's not even returning an exception and for a while there's like some issues with like throwing exec exceptions uh, reverting like the state of a contract. Those were like concepts that are like uh, very new that have been introduced like uh, recently. Uh, time dependency vulnerability. While some of the actual like uh, instruction give you like some time information, but they're related to a block, um, so you can easily like guess like the uh, future output and delegate call would be what happened with uh, the uh, parity uh, contract. Um, so. There is uh, a fork of Ethereum called Corum uh, created by JP Morgan which is uh, pretty interesting because the main reason uh, people were uh, a bit worried also with uh, Ethereum is basically uh, if you're an enterprise you cannot just have everything like written like transparently so they introduced this uh, privacy layer uh, and permissions uh, to uh, smart contracts which is pretty cool. Um, like the Quorum team is here, so I don't know if you guys want to stand up. I don't know if uh, people are gonna see, but uh, 
uh, that's, that's a pretty cool project. Uh, we see a lot of stuff happening uh, around like Ethereum, which is pretty cool. Uh, and uh, this week, like uh, Corum just released um, uh, a, a bundle to uh, integrate like Porosity uh, to check like nodes inside the actual network. So that's uh, that's pretty cool too. And like I was saying, the main thing which is a bit worrying, and what we hear like so many like uh, stories about the uh, ICOs hack, and for sure why we're gonna see uh, more of those stories like over the summer, is mainly because there is no proper like testing tools for that new like software layer, which is pretty nuts, you know. Uh, you, you you guys have seen how long it took for like traditional software to get like proper security tools. Um, to be tested, even like uh, SDL stuff, like uh, those type of like high level uh, framework. Um, well, with smart contracts, it's pretty much ground zero. So I've never heard of it in most of cases. That's why there's like a need for like such tools. Um, so here is like some screenshot of the uh, Corum and Porosity uh, integration. So then it can be integrated in the actual workflow, um, which is uh, pretty good, at least to. Uh, Think of integrating uh, tools like that uh, in the actual workflow. It was very fast for the uh, Corum team to uh, do the integration. Uh, they have a pretty good framework, so they can uh, actually like add uh, more and more tools like very quickly, which is pretty good. And in my opinion, it's like a requirement if people are going to start really using like smart contracts seriously, especially to store money. Uh, again, like. If you write a smart contract, most of the time you use it to store money, right? Not to browse uh, YouTube and watch cat videos. Uh, I mean, yeah. You know, like if you find like a zero day in, like, uh, in a web browser, then you would have to struggle to find where to sell it. Well, if you find a bug in a smart contract, you just like take the bank, you know? It's like uh, being a Lazarus uh, group, but for cryptocurrency. Uh, so, like I was saying, for sure we would see like more and more. Uh, Test uh, testing tools, and like we can definitely expect like by the end of the year even more like issues with like ICOs hack, uh, since like every like it's like the new thing everybody wants to like raise money with ICOs. Um, we're getting the tools, so there is like some improvement uh, required for like uh, uh, for a lot of the uh, conditional statements, and uh, when it comes to uh, Ethereum and security, uh, like I was saying, is like there is a fast-growing community, especially like. Now the main incentive is, well, either you want to steal money or you want to protect your money, right? So it's pretty straightforward in terms of uh, motives if you want to get into like smart contract security. Uh, and like I was saying, initially when I looked at it, I was like, oh, why is everybody talking about blockchain? It sounds like really boring. Um, then I saw there were like some like virtual machine around. I was like, oh, maybe there's some interesting thing to do. And and for those who are like familiar with uh, virtual machine. Uh, Vulnerabilities. Uh, well, QMU has a lot of them, but then you have like uh, you know like talks like cloudburst that happened like many years ago. Uh, I think it was Black Hat 2010 or something, um, where basically uh, you would be able to do a VM escape, and now like VM escape are becoming more and more common. Even like uh, Microsoft now with uh, Hyper-V vulnerabilities are raising their bug bounty. Uh, well, you can be sure if you have. Uh, you own virtual machine, you can also expect bugs in it, right? Uh, and then, like, the whole thing of claiming it's sandbox does not really apply. Um, so, the question now is is Ethereum gonna stay alive? And if their virtual machine is gonna be the main virtual machine, or if we're gonna see like more provider for smart contracts with their own virtual machines? Uh, I was looking at the roadmap for next year, and I saw they are you know, planning to use like WebAssembly. Um, I had no idea what was WebAssembly, and then I looked into it, and basically, uh, so that's how it's being described. It's a portable uh, load time efficiency format, so you have like your own bytecode uh, that can be executed uh, by most of the uh, JavaScript engine, like uh, V8 or SpiderMonkey. Uh, and so they're planning to use the same engine that we would see in web browser to a smart contract um, I don't know if it's a good or bad idea. I guess from the fact that it's also going to be used by other platforms, it would also benefit of uh, the auditing for that specific uh, language. Uh, and in terms of performance, I've seen like uh, some cool stuff. Like if you look at the uh, demos online, the guys are like 
running like almost like video games with it. They can even like compile. Well, I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but uh, you can compile like C++ code into like WebAssembly. Uh, I mean, from an attack surface, you know, it seems a bit confusing. You go from like having a VM with a specific set of instruction to like being able to compile C++. Um, so I don't know to which extent it's going to be used in the uh, Ethereum VM by next year, uh, but for sure uh, we would see like stuff uh, leveraging that. Um, so there are some people I wanted to, uh, to thank uh, who helped me like during uh, the paper. So uh, including like the DevCon uh, review board because initially I was just sending a decompiler. I was like, well, but can we use it for security? I was like, well, obviously it's a decompiler, so you can do anything. So they kind of pushed me to do like uh, the security analysis for it. Um, so if you want to download like the slides and the actual white paper which is uh, more complete and uh, and in case you didn't understand my French accent which I can understand but you know what can I say I'm French you know I'm not going to apologize but uh you can download like the uh, actual like tool at this address and uh yeah if you have any question you can either drop me an email or we have uh 3 minutes uh now so I don't know it works for like Q&A here but uh yeah, if you have any question, uh, let me know.